Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure. I'm always very well treated here, and I like being here. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, for those who came to listen to the talk that was announced, um, I have to disappoint you. I will talk about something else. I will talk about integer programming um, because uh, for two reasons. Because I just basically finished a write-up of, of this paper together with uh, Robert Weismantel, and it, um, I feel that it has more connections to people here uh, uh, in Waterloo, as you will soon see. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is a joint work with Robert Weismantel. He's my colleague from the other uh, federal university in Switzerland. He's in Zurich. Okay, so um, I will speak about integer programming, about algorithms for integer programming, and how to speed them up with a theorem from uh, the beginning of the uh, 20th century uh, by Steinitz and I will explain you the best bounds uh, that are meanwhile known for this uh, Steinitz lemma. Um, and uh, well, what's the subject? We have an optimization problem of the form maximize C transpose times X, AX less than or equal to B, and X has to be integer. So that's the well-known integer programming problem. So here we have an example. We have uh, a polyhedron, which is describing our uh, feasible points. This is the objective function, and we try to find a point that is integral and feasible, satisfying all the constraints and maximizing the objective function value, C transpose times X. Okay, so um, integer programming uh, algorithms, what's the state of the art? Um, if you have N variables, so the space that we're talking about is uh, Rn or Zn, then uh, you can solve an integer program in roughly two to the O of n cubed or O of n squared if you analyze it carefully time. So this is by an algorithm of Lenstra from 1983. It's a very well known uh, result that showed that integer programming in fixed dimension can be solved in polynomial time. So what's missing here is the uh, factor polynomial of the input lengths that I avoid. Um, then in 1987, Kanan, Ravi Kanan showed that the integer program can be solved in time two to the O of n times log n time. And since n, it's uh, one of the, I would say, to me at least, uh, most interesting uh, and prominent mysteries and algorithms, whether you can solve an integer program in n variables in two to the O of n in singly exponential time. The um, best constant in the exponent is uh, currently held by Daniel Dadouche. He has shown this in his thesis in 2012. He has, he has lowered the, constant, the, the best known constant that is hidden in the O notation up here in the algorithm of Kanan. But still, this two to the O of n time is, is an open problem. Okay, so um, I would like to uh, speak about pseudo-polynomial time algorithms for integer programming. And here, uh, the state of the art was as follows. We now have an integer program in so-called standard form. That means that we have an equation here. So we have AX is equal to B, an affine uh, subspace of R to the N. X has to be greater or equal to zero. And X is an integer vector. And we have to maximize, again, some linear objective function. So this is an integer program in so-called standard form. Now. Um, a is a matrix which has m rows and n columns, and B is a vector having m entries. Now, if all these entries of the matrix and of the vector B are bounded by delta, then you can, um, it is a result of, of Papa Dimitrio from the 80s, that you can solve this uh, integer programming problem in m times delta to the O of m squared time. So again, m is the number of rows, and delta is an upper bound on all the entries in A and B. And, uh, well, we assume A and B, they're integer. So that's a result from, uh, of, of Papa Dimitrio in, uh, from 1981. And um, if now m is fixed, and then we have a pseudo-polynomial uh, time algorithm in the input encoding. So for m being fixed, 
uh, integer programming can be solved in pseudo-polynomial time. Now let me shortly explain to you how this dynamic program works. Um, basically, if you imagine to have a vertex solution of the, of the uh, linear programming relaxation of this integer program here, so a vertex solution x star would be something basically, well, if you have basic variables, would be something like ab to the minus one times b, okay? Now, um, this is the inverse of the basis matrix AB, and clearly the Hadamard bound then kicks in when you want to uh, say something about optimal solutions that have minimal infinity norm. And what you can show is that there exists an optimal solution um, whose components are then bounded by, well, this is roughly the, uh, the Hadamard bound, uh, n times m type, uh, times delta to the power of m. Okay, and then you can build up a dynamic program as follows. You record the variables, or the last variable that you have taken care of, that would be the uh, i's variable, and then you have an x that is represented so far. Okay, so you have to see this as follows. So this would be the first component, a1 times x1, and so on, plus ai times xi, and this is recorded here in this state. Okay, and then, then depending on whether you're using this variable or not, you have um, a, a, follows, a following, so, sorry, a state that then follows, right? For example, here you could say, well, I take the i plus first column, I take the, uh, the i plus first variable, I said xi is equal to, let's say, uh, some, some constant s, and then this would be here, I take care of the i plus first variables and I have x plus s times a i plus one here. And um, well, the cost of this arc would then be um, the cost of c i plus one, the first uh, i plus first variable times s, okay? And in this way, you build a directed acyclic graph and you're trying to find a maximum weight pass from the start to um, the state here where we have taken care of all the variables and we are hitting the vector b that we want in the end. Uh, well, that, is, that is the right hand side of the integer program here. Okay, now the number of nodes of this graph is, as you can see, well, we've, we've seen the components, they're bounded by u, right? And, and the vectors, they are in r to the m, the vectors that we're hitting. And this means that u to the power of m is roughly a, a bound on the number of vectors that we can potentially hit. So we see that uh, the number of nodes is uh, lower bounded by m times delta to the m squared, right? Because u was something like m times delta to the power of m. So what I will show to you is how to get rid of this m squared and make it an m. Let's say an O of m, okay? And this we will do with the Steinitz lemma. Okay, so this will be our first result that I would like to explain to you. An IP in standard form, right? So maximize C transpose times X, AX equal to B, and X in the integers, uh, in the non-negative integers, can be solved in time O of M times delta to the power of 2M, whereas before, so this uh, long-standing best bound by Papadimitriou was something like O of M times delta times uh, that, uh, omega of m squared. Okay, any questions so far? I have a question, how much time do I have? <laughs> 50 minutes. 50 minutes? 55. 55, okay, good. 50, uh, can we negotiate, I mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is the Steinitz lemma? I mean, there are many Steinitz lemmas and um, Lemmata, I had Latin at school, I forgot, anyways. So there are many uh, Steinitz uh, lemmata. Um, the one that we use is the following. We have, uh, it concerns uh, vectors in R to the N, and all these vectors are of bounded norm. They are of norm at most one. It doesn't matter which norm, in fact. And we have the condition that these vectors in Rm, excuse me, this should be in R to the M. Remember, M was our was the number of rows of our integer program. So they should sum up to zero, yeah? Now, if this is the case, then there exists a permutation, a reordering of these vectors, 
such each partial sum. So for each k, the sum, this, this vector that we get by taking the sum from i equal 1 until k, uh, x pi has norm bounded by m. Okay, so in a sense, um, it could look like this. We have vectors that here's a zero, right? So, so vectors of norm one that we add up and maybe they go wild around in space and they add up to zero. Yeah? Then we can rearrange them in such a way that if we now take the ball of radius m times, well, m times one, they will stay in here. Okay, so all these partial sums will not be larger than m. Now, um, I should say that we are not the first ones who have uh, used uh, the, the Steinitz lemma in the context of integer programming. Uh, in fact, Dash, uh, Fuku, Fukuzawa, and Gunlück in 2012 have uh, given an alternative to, uh, to the uh, um, dynamic programming algorithm of Papa Dimitrio which also runs in pseudo-polynomial time if m is fixed, um, provided that a certain geometric constant or geometric bound is constant uh, in constant dimension. And the fact that this actually holds was then shown by Buchen et al. in 2012. And uh, these, uh, these authors here, they have used the Steinitz lemma to, to bound this uh, function of the dimension. And, uh, but this is a, a different road. Yeah, so their algorithm is then exponential in this function, which would be doubly ex exponential in m, but still uh, um, pseudo-polynomial time if the dimension m is fixed, or the number of rows uh, m is fixed of the um, integer program. So we were not the first, but we're going a different road. We're going to uh, look at proximity of the LP and IP integer solution and find new ways to speed up the dynamic programming approaches. Any questions so far? Okay, good. So let's see how the Steinitz lemma, and this is actually uh, now pretty straightforward, the, the, how the Steinitz lemma that I just uh, told you about speeds up dynamic programming. Okay, so suppose that x star is a solution of ax is equal to b, okay? Then, um, we let si be the sign of x star i, the i's component, then what we do is we now construct a Steinitz sequence of vectors yeah, that in the end will sum up to zero. You see in the end we have here minus b. And well, we'd have s1 times a1, s1 times a1. How many times, how many copies will we have of this s1 times a1? Well, the absolute value of x1 star then absolute value of x2 star, s2 times a2, uh, many uh, copies of yeah, yeah, s2 times a2, and the absolute value of xn star, copies of sn, an, and in the end, b. So this is a Steinitz sequence because all these vectors, right, they will sum up to zero. Now, what is the infinity norm of any of these vectors? Well, we said that the entries of the matrix and of b, that's the setting of Papa Dimitriou, is bounded by delta. Right? So this means that the infinity norm of all these vectors is bounded by delta. Okay? So that means that uh, we can now reorder the sequence in such a way that any partial sum does not exceed, well, because we have b here in the end, and this b has to be removed, right? so does not exceed 2 times delta in absolute value, sorry, 2 times delta in the infinity norm. Okay? So that means that that we will have uh, to look at vectors of infinity norm at most two times delta, and we start at zero, and we have to end up at b. So right, this would, would be a starting point. This would be a starting point, and we have to end up here at b. Now, uh, and we look at all the integer vectors in this box, okay? Now, how many, this will be, this will be our, our node set of our graph. So how many, of the, how many integer vectors do we have? Well, this is uh, four times delta plus one to the power of m, right? So remember, m is the number of rows, okay? So in, in, this is the dimension of this, of, this, uh, of this space. So we will have four times delta plus one to the power of m 
many integer points in here. And now the arc set will be the following. So there will be an arc from x to x plus ai, where ai is the ith row of the matrix. Okay, so this is ai, so this is our matrix A. Okay, and that means that I can go from x to x plus ai at cost ci. So I'm taking the variable i uh, here when I go from x to x plus ai. And um, well, how many arcs do we have? Well, number of vertices times uh, the number of variables, okay? Which would be something like um, O of delta uh, to the m uh, times n. Okay, good. All right, so this would be O of delta to the power of m. Okay, good. So now it's pretty clear that if in this direct, if we have a, a cycle in this, uh, in this directed graph that is positive, then the integer program will be unbounded, right? Because we can go around the cycle as often as we want, and it has positive uh, um, objective function, so the integer program is unbounded. Um, good, so if there is no cycle of positive length, then we can find the longest pass from zero to B with the standard shortest pass algorithm, okay? Which would have then a running time in the end of O of V times A, and that is O of delta to the 2M times N. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our running time for integer programming in this Papa Dimitrio setting using the Steinitz lemma, okay? Pretty clear. Any questions? Yeah. Yes, it is tight. And to entertain you, I would like to show you now the proof of the Steinitz lemma. Okay? Good. So this proof that I would like to show to you is by Grinberg and Sebastianov from, from 1980. And it will remind you um, of techniques that are used in discrepancy theory. Um, in particular, the Beck-Fiala theorem, if you have read the proof of this, techniques are based on linear programming. Okay, so, so what, is, what is our goal? We have vectors x1 until xn, they are in r to the m, and the norm of all these vectors is bounded by one, and they sum up to zero. Okay, so what we want is, we want to reorder them in such a way that each partial sum is of norm at most m. Okay, how do we do it? Um, I mean, this is the proof of Grimberg and Sebastiano. This is not uh, our result. Okay, so what you do is you take, you construct sets beginning with a n, a set a n that contains all the numbers from one until n, all the indices of vectors, and then you construct the next set and you construct uh, until you construct the set a m, such that you have the following conditions. The first one is that the cardinality of the set a k is equal to k. Okay. And the second condition is this. So for each of these sets, you now look at a system of linear inequalities, and the system of linear inequalities has to be feasible. And which system is this? Well, you take all the indices in the set AK, you have the variable, variable lambda i, and then you take your uh, vector v, uh, sorry, your vector xi, And this has to, has to be equal to zero. And then you take again all the indices in AK. You take your lambda i, and this has to sum up to K minus M. Okay, so K is the set uh, cardinality, is the cardinality of set AK. And then you have the constraint that the variables lambda i have to be between zero and one. Okay? So once you have done this, Okay, so once you've shown that such uh, sets a, a, n until a, m exist, you do the following. You say, well, my permutation that I construct is this. I send i to, okay, so this must be in set notation, uh, to the only, uh, the only element that is an a i, but not 
in Ai minus 1. Okay? And now let's see that, in fact, uh, this gives us such a, such a reordering. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, we want to argue now about these vectors. I, I show you in a moment. I, I explain to you that uh, how to construct these a, 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 a n until a m. Yeah. So, but uh, let's see that this does the job. We take um, we take a look now at the norm of the vector i in a k, and I have here x i, and I hope that this is at most m. Okay. Good. Well, but you see, since I have this constraint here, this is the same as the norm of i and a k, and I have 1 minus lambda i times x i. Okay, and now use the triangle inequality. This is less than or equal to the i and a k, 1 minus lambda i. Okay, and this is equal to what? Well, k minus k minus m. And that's equal to m. Okay, good. So, how do we construct these? How do we construct these uh, sets? Well, it's easy. In the beginning, we start with a n, uh, one until n. The conditions here are satisfied because the vectors they sum up to zero. Okay, no problem. Now the point is this: if you have constructed your set a k, okay, suppose that we have constructed the set a k then we know that this system of inequalities here is feasible. So let me, uh, let me surround the system of inequalities. So this system here is feasible, right, for this uh, AK. Now, how do I uh, construct AK minus one? So we have to construct the next set, right, AK minus one. How do we do this? Well, the first thing that you notice is, well, if this is solvable, yeah, if this here is so, then I can just simply scale this equation, and I see that it's also solvable for k minus one minus m. Okay, so if uh, you see what I what I just simply do is I replace this k minus m by k minus one minus m. Okay, good. So how many variables do we have? We have k variables. Okay, how many equations do we have in this linear program? How many equations? So the xi here, they live in space r to the m, right? So we have m plus one equations. Okay, good. Now let's look at a vertex solution. A vertex solution can have at most m plus one fractional entries, but these m plus one fractional entries, they're less than one, right? And in the end, they have to sum up to k minus one minus m. That means that one of these non-fractional entries is zero, okay? There must be one lambda, let's say lambda j, which is equal to zero. And my ak minus one is just simply an ak without j. And everything is fine. I have a solution of the system here with respect to k minus one since, well, I have lambda j equal to zero. Okay, questions? Okay, so this is the Steiner's lemma uh, and the proof of uh, Grinberg and Sebastianov. Okay, good. So what else can we do with this very nice lemma in integer programming? We can look at the so-called so proximity bounds. And um, what are those? You look at the difference between or the, let's say a distance between an optimal solution x star of the linear programming relaxation and an optimal solution z star that is closest to this uh, uh, x star uh, in terms of some, some norm, okay? Now there is a very important result by uh, Bill Cook and co-authors from 1986, and they show that if you have an integer program in inequality standard form, right? So you have polyhedron AX less than equal to B, X and Z, Z to the N, and you want to maximize a linear objective function, then um, given some optimal solution X star to the linear programming relaxation, so where you forget 
that x has to be integral and just say it's, 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 uh, it's real. Now, for your x star, there exists an optimum solution z star of the integer program such that the infinity norm of z star minus x star is bounded by n times delta. And what is this delta? Well, this delta here is uh, the uh, largest subdeterminant in uh, absolute value. Okay. Good. So, um, good. But we, we are concerned. Ah, here, here's maybe just, yeah, I have here a picture on how to show this. The proof is very nice. Uh, it's very instructive. So if you have your optimal solution x star, and this uh, would be z star, uh, an integer optimal solution, yeah, what you do is you look at this vector, uh, which is z star minus x star, and you orient all the inequalities, you, you put all the inequalities tied at x star and you orient them in this direction. And uh, then you look at the generators of the cone, right, the generators of the cone, and you know that these, this, this uh, z star minus x star is generated, so it lies in this cone. So you can write this x star minus z star, you can write it as, uh, now with Kara Theodori, You can write it as uh, you know, i equal 1 until n. Now for some generators, let's call them hi, uh, that are integral, and basically their infinity norm, the infinity norm is bounded by this delta, again with the Hadamard bound, uh, times some lambda i. And you split this lambda i up in, a, in, a, in, a, in an integer and a fractional part. And then you see if you, if you just take the fractional part, you're still going to be feasible, but it's going to be another vector here, which is also integral. And that shows that, in fact, well, then the, the infinity norm of this x star minus z star is going to be bounded by the norm of this vector, which is then by the triangle inequality at most n times delta. Okay, so that's just a short uh, explanation of how, how to prove this. Good, so let's plug this in, uh, our integer program in equation form. So we have maximized c transpose times x, ax equal to b, and now we have even upper bounds, right? So this u here, there are some upper bounds. We didn't have them in this setting before. And what has also changed is this. So this delta is now only an upper bound on the entries of a. I don't require b to be any more bounded by delta, and I have upper bounds. So what does the result of, of Cook et al. give us? Well, it tells us that this z star minus x star is at most n times, and now here I use the Hadamard bound, um, for the largest subdeterminant of this matrix, of the constraint matrix, if we, if we convert it into inequality uh, standard form, will be in fact the largest subdeterminant of A, and this is again bounded by square root of m times delta to the delta a, right? So delta a is the largest absolute value of an entry of a to the power of m. And we have to multiply this with n. Okay. So what we can show is this. You see, if we if we would now say, let's look at the let's look at the one norm, right? So let's look at this in the one norm with a cook at our bound, we would then get an n squared times something like m times delta delta a to the power of m, basically, okay? But it happens that the Steinitz lemma now, again, helps us, and we can show that for each optimal fractional vertex x star, there exists an optimal integer solution z star whose distance in the one norm is bounded by m times, now basically, delta a times m to the power of m, okay? And what's interesting about this or maybe interesting about this, is that this is independent of n. Okay, so this is independent of the dimension. Uh, we basically save a factor of n squared compared to this, to this uh, um, classical and important general bound. Okay? Any questions? No? Okay. Okay, good. So, so how do we use the Steinitz lemma here? Um, 
we, we have to look or we have, we have to define what a cycle is of, of this distance or the difference z star, the integer. So this is the IP optimum and this x star, this is the LP optimum. Okay. So what is, a, what is a cycle of z star minus x star? That's an integer vector that is compatible in the or sense with z star minus x star. So what this means is the following. So each absolute value of a component of y is bounded by the absolute, uh, corresponding corres uh, component absolute value of z star minus x star. And the signs of y and the signs of z star minus x star uh, uh, are the same at the components. Okay, and then you can observe the following thing. So if, if you have a cycle, then it's pretty clear that z star minus y is a feasible IP solution as well. So if you have a cycle, we can find a new IP solution, z star minus y. And um, for each epsilon uh, larger than zero, if you have su such a cycle, this year, this x star, the LP optimum, sorry, there exists an epsilon larger than zero such that x star plus epsilon times y is a feasible LP solution, okay? Um, so why is that? Imagine, for example, that y1 is equal to 1, yeah? Then what could happen is, if we now go in the direction of, of y, we hit the upper bound immediately, but this is prevented here by this constraint. So x star is not tied at the upper bound because uh, we have a cycle, right? So, uh, I forgot one thing, excuse me, I forgot one thing very important. This is nonsense what I'm saying, really nonsense. Because what is important is that, so what does y have to satisfy? A times y is equal to zero, right? So this must, this, this is part of the definition, sorry about this, okay. So um, you see uh, that then, then I can add, then I can add this y to, to, to uh, z star, uh, sorry, yeah, subtract y from z star and have a feasible IP solution. Okay, good. And um, yeah, and the consequence of this is that c transpose times y is less than or equal to zero, right? Because x star was an optimum IP solution, right? So I cannot go, uh, I, I can go in the direction of y, but then y must be of uh, objective function value at most, zero. And what we have, immediately then is the following lemma. If you have x star and z star, they are optimal solutions of the LP and the IP respectively, such that the z star minus x star uh, one, so the distance between them in the one norm is minimal, then there cannot exist the cycle of z star minus x star because I could just simply take it, get an IP solution which is, uh, you know, I could, I could subtract it from z star, get an IP solution which is at least so, uh, as good and the L1 norm would have, uh, would have become, they, they move closer to each other. Okay. Good, so let's, uh, uh, yeah, so I, st I still have 10 minutes something or? Yeah, 15, okay, good. So let's, let's, uh, let's now look at the proof of, this, of the proximity bound. Um, Okay, so what I'm claiming is the following. If, if z star minus x star is minimal in the, in the L1 norm, then this L1 norm is at most m. You remember this is the number of rows of my integer program in standard form is at most m times now uh, 2m delta plus one to the power of m. Okay, good. So, so how do we prove this? Uh, we do again, uh, we, we want to use again the, the, the Steinitz lemma. Um, yeah. So we take, we break our solution x star, we break it up into integer part and fractional part. Okay? And then since a times z star minus x star is equal to zero, I have this. Okay? Where I have a times z star minus x star minus a times x star fractional part is equal to zero. Now I want to again to construct a, a Steinitz sequence of vectors that in the end adds up to zero. Okay, so I do this again as before. You see I get, I get V1, which would be the first column of A if Z star minus X star rounded down and the first component would be positive. 
uh, it would be minus A1 if it was negative and it wouldn't appear the column if, if this was equal to zero. So I get here uh, the first vectors just as before. And then I have here the last vector, which is A times X star. But um, you see X star has, it, it's a fractional um, vertex. So it has at most M entries and these M entries of X star fractional part are between zero and one. So this A times X star is a vector uh, of infinity norm at most M times delta. So what I can do is I can just simply decompose it into M vectors where each of these vectors Wi is, at, is of infinity norm at most delta. Okay, and this will now be my, my Steinitz sequence. And okay, so this would be W1 until Wm. Okay, so these vectors, they sum up to zero. The norms of these vectors in the infinite, the infinite norms are bounded by delta of all of them. Okay, so what I can do now, again, I can rearrange the sequence. And let's say this, uh, this is the rearrangement with our permutation pi. This then looks like this. We have U1 until U T plus M. Okay, in such a way that if, if I take now the partial sums starting from one, they will all remain in, uh, they will all have norm at most. So the partial sums, let's say, let's call them PI, which is the sum from, oh, let's call it PJ, from I equal one to J uh, UI. So this PJ will be of infinity norm at most M times delta. Okay, that's what Steinitz says. Good. And now, uh, so we have the following thing. We, 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 are, we are moving in a box, and this box has side length M, M times delta. Um, here is zero. We start here, and then we move around in, with the Steinitz sequence. Okay? All right, so what I'm claiming is that we can hit, now if we, go this, if we follow this Steinitz, Steinitz sequence, we can, each vector, each point here, let's say this green point, if I look at this green point, it can, it can be visited at most m times, okay? Um, why? Well, so if I, if I, if I visit it more than m, m times, let's say I visit m plus one times, um, Good, so, so you see we have, we have these, these partial sums, so this is P0, oh, sorry, P1, P2, and so on. And there is P uh, T plus M. Okay, good. So the point is that we have those guys here, these W1 until WM, they are not columns of A. They are coming from this, con uh, this decomposition of our remainder here, right? So, uh, but, but we have at most M of them. So this means that these M, they are somewhere, they are somewhere hidden, or they're somewhere, no, they're, not, they're not somewhere hidden. They are, they are somewhere uh, stemming, okay. So those are, not the, the, those are not the partial sums, those are the vectors in the sequence, okay. But they, they give us these partial sums. These partial sums that we are visiting here. Okay, so now we have at most M of these remainders, and the point is this. Um, if I now revisit, uh, no, sorry, well, bad explanation, excuse me. Um, so what I want to say here is that these, these green points, let's make them green. So those are, this is the point that we revisit. It's in fact the partial sum set M. That I'm, uh, that I'm talking about. Okay, so those are the partial sums, and I, I revisit these green points here in my partial sums. Okay, but there, is, there are these guys here that can spoil uh, my, my uh, intervals here a bit, and let me explain what I mean by this. So look at this interval, okay? So if this interval uh, stems from adding up only columns, right, then what will I have? I will have that this vector is equal to this vector, and it 
comes from a partial sum from here until from the beginning until the, this green point and from the beginning until this green point. So this partial sum minus this partial sum is going to be zero. So this gives me a cycle. Okay? So if this if if I have a pure, so if this is a pure interval, then I have a cycle. And that's a contradiction. So by pure interval, I mean that you know, I move from this point to this by adding or subtracting a column, and so on and so on, and I end up at the same point. By adding or subtracting, I, I, I get a cycle. Okay, but these remainders here, they can kind of spoil these pure intervals, and, uh, but that's no problem either. So either we say we, we, can, we can visit the point at most m plus one times, right? Then we for sure would have a pure interval, but you know, m plus m plus one is not as nice as a constant as m, so you do some a little bit of extra uh, thinking and tweaking and you get m, but I spare you the details of this. Any question? Good, so, so this is the proof, right? So we, we, have proved, uh, we have proved this proximity bound, and um, let me just tell you, um, we could improve uh, upon a bound that is in one of these, uh, in, 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 an, in an IPCO 2012 uh, paper by Aliyev et al., they have, they have shown the following. If you have a knapsack problem, so an integer knapsack problem, which is an integer program with one row, yeah, and um, x has to be non-negative, non okay, they show that the gap, so the integrality gap, that, so that's a very important concept, concept, the integrality gap in approximation algorithms rounding, uh, so the integrality gap is bounded by the one norm of C times delta, where delta is the largest absolute value of an entry in A. Okay? Now we can improve upon this as follows. Okay, so you see we have, we take here for this x star minus z star, we take our proximity bound in the L1 norm. Okay? Clearly, C transpose times x star minus z star is at most the infinity norm of C times the L1 norm of, the dis of, of this vector. So this is at most the infinity norm of C times two delta A, so basically C infinity times delta in terms of C1 times delta. So this is an improvement of a factor uh, of N whenever C1 is N times C infinity. So this is via the distance bound and this improvement of factor n if c1 is n times c infinity. Okay, good. So now I'm almost finished uh, with my presentation, but there are some other things I would like to mention. So if you look at algorithms for knapsacks, what is, what is in fact, what is now the strength of the new proximity bound when you, when, you, when you design dynamic programming algorithms for integer programming. Um, yeah, I should maybe mention the following. So, so Tamir uh, in uh, 2009 has looked at algorithms for knapsack, but delta A is again a bound on the absolute value, on, on, on the entries of, of A, right? Not, not the right-hand side beta, just A. Um, so he has shown that in the unbounded knapsack case, which means where the bounds are basically the capacity of the knapsack, there's an algorithm of, n, of running time n squared times delta a, and in the bounded case, n cubed times delta a. Because we're saving this factor of n, uh, we get uh, immediately uh, algorithms which improve upon these running times by a factor of n again. Okay? But um, I would like to mention just briefly what what, what the, uh, let's say, the, what maybe the reason is for, uh, yeah, okay, what, what, is, what is reason, why do we get better or faster algorithms for dynamic programming with this uh, proximity point, uh, um, with this proximity bound? So let's look at, uh, at the knapsack problem here that we want to solve, okay? Maximize C transpose X, A transpose times X equal to beta, zero less than equal to X less than equal to U, X and Z to the N. And, um, well, 
we take a fractional optimal solution and we know that z in, in the L1 norm, so z minus x star, so x star is the fractional solution, is at most, okay, I'm simplifying things, I'm leaving our constant, is at most delta A, okay? So that's our proximity bound. So that means that we, yeah, that we, that we have to solve, uh, once we have solved the fractional problem, we are left with solving an integer program like this. We have A transpose times Z is equal to zero, and we have lower and upper bounds, where these lower and upper bounds are, how far, how, how far are they away from each other? Or let's say L, the lower upper bound, sorry, the lower bound here, L star infinity, is at most delta A, and also the upper bound is at most delta A, okay? And this is, the, this is the important part. So the one norm of z is at most two times delta a plus one. Let's forget the two and the plus one, so it's at most uh, delta a, okay? That means that when I d design now a dynamic program, I look at these stages, right? So I have, I have let's say I have the first i variables uh, um, set. Then I know that the, well, since the L1 norm of the solution until the i uh, component is at most delta, and since all the entries of A are at most delta, I know that I have represented a number that is at most delta square, okay? So I have here an interval of delta square A, and I now want to see, I want to go to the next interval, I want to set xi, and I uh, do here the following, so I have here a point, let's say this is a point uh, um, uh, alpha, and this would be the point alpha plus uh, ai, and this would have cost then uh, ci, okay? And I also have to look at multiplicities, okay? So I can, I have multiplicities of this, of this ice variable and so on. Good, and then with a standard trick, what I can do is, I can, I, well, I can say that uh, the multiplicity that I'm having, I, I convert it into binary uh, um, variables. So then I get, uh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, then I get, in the end, an algorithm which runs basically in time uh, delta A uh, squared times the logarithm of delta A squared times N, okay? And that's really uh, much better if the logarithm of delta A squared is small compared to N, and I think this is also what you have in mind when you talk about a pseudo-polynomial time algorithm. It shouldn't, delta A shouldn't be exponential in N. Okay, so you get faster algorithms in this way. You know what I mean? So if you have, you know, if you have a multiplicity, like, like a, a potential multiplicity of the upper bound, then you, you can say, well, you see if I have this bit number here, I can, I can represent it with, uh, with these numbers. And then the one, right? So the sum, any sum of a subset of these numbers will be a number that is at most this. Okay, so I take the number of bits of u and I can, you know, this is standard in, in dynamic programming. So you get an algorithm like this for knapsack and also similarly for integer programming, you have in the end an algorithm which is, well, with upper bounds, right? So don't forget, in the, in the setting of, of um, Papa Dimitri, we didn't have upper bounds on the variables. Uh, so we have here delta A to the power of M times M plus one, and that's the, the dominating factor here. Okay. But that brings me to my, my open problem. Um, so what we have seen is we, have, we, could, we could solve uh, in, the, in the setting considered by Papa Demetrio, we could reduce this O of M squared to an O of M. But if we have upper bounds on the variables, in the, at least, yeah, then, then uh, um, we still have the factor O of M squared, oh, sorry, the exponent O of M squared. And the open problem would be, would be um, that I, consider pretty interesting whether we can some get, get, get something of order n times delta to the O of n. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I have one question. Uh, the conjecture on your first slide uh, about n-dimensional linear programming, in two linear. to the big O of n. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's true? Do you think you can do that? There's no good argument for why it shouldn't be true. 
that's I think that's the that's the point. I mean, if you look at uh, yeah, so if you so maybe people didn't seriously think about it to find a lower bound based on the exponential time hypothesis uh, that is let's say not singly exponential. Maybe one should one should think about this. Are there any more questions? Thank you. Oh, it's not. <laughs>